Thank you very much for joining me here tonight in Santa Maria dell'Anima in Rome. We are very close to Blessed Emperor Karl for three reasons. Firstly, because you see him right behind me in his relic. Secondly, because we have prayed a rosary together. And this is something Karl of Austria did every day of his life. And thirdly, because today we commemorate the 100 years of Karl's first attempt to return to Hungary from his exile in Switzerland. In fact, it is now nearly to the minute, the time when on March 26, 1921, the emperor suddenly arrived at Sombothay, much to the surprise of the local bishop. Looking back at this first failed attempt, three years after World War I ended, it is easy to laugh about it, to call the emperor naive or misguided, because we have the advantage or disadvantage of hindsight. We know this first attempt did not succeed, just like the second in October 1921, which then led to exile in Madeira for the emperor and his wife, and not too much later to his death in exile in 1922. However, we have to beware of easy conclusions. In a similar manner, more recently, historians have challenged our old idea of the doomed Austro-Hungarian monarchy. They have shown that had there not been a world war, the monarchy would not have ended anyway, but was in fact vibrant and working. In a similar way, we might see that there were good reasons that Karl's plan to return to Hungary might have worked. I propose to do this in three steps. First, I will give a brief description of the events 100 years ago today. Then, I'd like to analyze his motivations and the arguments, pro and contra, what he did. Finally, we could ask what the events 100 years ago might teach us today. Please bear in mind that I can only sketch things today and that you find much longer and also fascinating accounts of the events around Sombathe in books and, of course, online. First part, the trip to Sombathe. Yesterday morning, 100 years ago, Blessed Karl departed from his Swiss exile in Prangin and crossed the French border on foot with the passport of his Portuguese gardener who looked like him. He had not told anybody about his plans, even in his close surroundings. He took a train to Strasbourg and from there went to Vienna, where he arrived late yesterday evening in the apartment of his good friend, Count Tomasz Erdödi, who was totally flattened by the appearance in Vienna of his emperor. By the way, Charles Coulomb visited the place where Karl slept a few days ago. And if you go on his Twitter account, you can see it there. In some way, this was an opening to this commemoration. The next morning, which is today in the morning, with the help of friends and cars, they crossed the border to Hungary at Zinnersdorf in a very adventurous way. As Burgenland was then still with Hungary, this border crossing point now lies in the middle of an Austrian Bundesland. They knelt at the resurrection procession in a village. This was the Saturday of Easter, and the resurrection procession in 1921 was still on Saturday morning. They even had lunch in an inn, almost without being recognized. The innkeeper kept the plates and cutlery of his illustrious guest. I repeat, you can find hour-to-hour -hour descriptions of that trip online and in books. So by and by, the emperor made his way to Sombothe, where he arrived shortly before 10 in the evening, in fact, nearly to the minute, 100 years ago now. He stayed as a guest of Bishop Janos Mikesh, who was as delighted as he was surprised about his very unexpected visitor. After meeting with several prominent politicians during the night, Karl, the next morning, that will be tomorrow for us, took a train to Budapest, where he met with Regent Miklos Horthy. Karl tried to convince him to cede his power, as had been agreed 
the last time they met. But Horty declined to do so, arguing that the neighboring small Entente powers of Czechoslovakia, Romania and Yugoslavia would attack if Karl were reinstalled on the throne. Finally, after getting nowhere for three hours, the emperor returned to Sombate, where he promptly fell ill with fever. This impeded his leaving Hungary for several days. Diplomats and politicians began to flow to that town until all the hotel rooms were taken. In the meanwhile, the menaces and pressure from the neighbors grew. Troops in Czechoslovakia mobilized immediately and Yugoslavia demanded Karl to be dethroned. And as agreed beforehand, France denied having promised Karl anything. Finally, after one week, Karl left the country by train on April 4, in quite a triumphant way, with people cheering their emperor at several stations. Sorry, I must say their king, because for the Hungarians, Karl was only king, not emperor. The attempt to take back the crown of Hungary had failed. Second part, the reasons and motivations. Why did the emperor do this? Why didn't he simply spend a very pleasant life with his family in Switzerland after all the nightmarish time in the war, where he had done his best to achieve peace and in the end had to leave the country? His older children re remember this time in Switzerland as the happiest time of their lives, where their beloved parents were entirely theirs. Certainly, Karl and Zita were free to enjoy each other's company. Without the wartime separations that had plagued them since 1914, it was the closest any of them would ever come to a normal home life. Karl also could have simply accepted the end of the Habsburg rule over his people, in a way coming a poetical full circle as his exile place Pongin was only 200 kilometers from the Habsburg castle in Argau, where it had all begun roughly a thousand years ago. But he didn't. Why? Was he out of the world, naive, ambitious, power hungry? Someone who couldn't read the signs of the times, couldn't let go? In fact, it is surprisingly clear why he did it. He tells us in his own words in a letter to Pope Benedict XV that he wrote the morning when he left. We have indications that the emperor through an intermediary might have been personally encouraged by the pope. However, in his letter he says he is doing this not because of ambition, but because of my duty as a crown king. He writes that he has pondered long about it, and praise God that he may lead him so his actions may bring about happiness and peace for his people. This is not window dressing or pious talk with Karl. It also totally fits with what Empress Zita, his wife, told us once. I had the honor to meet her in person, and while we were chewing the slightly dry cookies she offered us, she told us children in great detail about the coronation in Budapest to become king of Hungary. She said it deeply, deeply impressed itself upon her husband, the weight of the anointing with chrism, the duty towards God it entailed. Never forget that Karl wasn't beatified by Pope John Paul II for nothing. He was deeply pious, went to Mass every day, said the rosary daily, and carried all his decisions in prayer, just like his wife, the Empress, did, for whom the beatification process has started now. I might have made the trip to Hungary look a bit like an adventurous picnic excursion in my description before, but it was in fact a risky and dangerous endeavor. Karl could have been arrested at any moment, while in Austria and perhaps also later. So the whole event also shows us the daring and courageous spirit of this gentle-faced monarch. Finally, we shouldn't forget that Hungary was still a monarchy in 1921, Horthy was still there to keep the country for the monarch, and that Karl was that monarch. Before departing, Karl had assured himself of the support of France for his plan. As it happened, French Premier Aristide Briand 
was desirous of a Habsburg restoration in Hungary for several reasons, and had worked with Karl on the latter's attempt to end the First World War early. He promised the exiled monarch protection from the newly formed surrounding nations and desperately needed French financial credits if he succeeded in regaining the throne. However, also a denial that he knew anything about it should the attempt fail. So don't forget this, had Horty immediately ceded the throne to Karl without dallying, France would have stood by the emperor. Were there good reasons against Karl's return, as Admiral Horty pointed out, of course there were very good arguments. Hungary was in a very fragile state immediately after the Treaty of Trianon, surrounded by the very neighbors, na nervous neighbors of the small Entente. There was a real danger of an attack. However, it is also not easy to evaluate the exact motivations that led Horty and his surroundings in these very stressful hours. Was the Admiral only mindful of the Hungarian nation and people? Or might personal interests have played a certain role? Finally, was the failure of Sombatei and Budapest a failure in total? I don't know. Had the plan worked, the emperor would never have died in Madeira the next year, offering his death for his people, a very impressive death that also played a key role in his beatification. If you have never read about this, you should absolutely. There is an English translation of Cessna's short but heart-wrenching booklet, Death of an Emperor. So we might say that God's plans were different than the emperor's, and humbly accepting the failure of his plans became a stepping stone on the way for his personal sanctity. I'll get to the end now. What is the lesson for our times and for every one of us today, for our personal lives? We might pause to think a moment about the politicians of our times. Would any of them risk or throw away a comfortable time in pension for reasons of duty? Let us pray God for politicians that put the well-being of their peoples and countries before their own interests, and also for such public servants in whose personal life and decisions faith, principles, God play a central role. I have pointed out several times on Twitter that we have a Habsburg WhatsApp group. Yes, I know. I once did an unofficial poll among the younger family members who their favorite Habsburg might be. Strangely, or not so strangely enough, it weren't legends like Franz Joseph or Maria Theresia, or even the much romanticized Empress Elizabeth, Sissi, that won the first prize, but the humble last emperor of our family, blessed Emperor Karl. When I asked some for the reasons, one of the nieces gave me a very clear answer because he tried to live his vocation to the maximum as a Christian, as a married family father, and in his work, which happened to be emperor. So if you want to live your vocation in your personal faith, your family, and your job, even if it's not emperor, the best way is to get to know this humble, warm-hearted, humorous human being, and hopefully one day, saint of the church read about him, pray for his intercession in intentions, and visit his relics like I did today. You can also join the Gebetsliga, League of Prayer, in your area, and pray for his canonization. Finally, be aware that this conference is just the beginning of a commemorative year that will end on April 1st, 2022, the day Emperor Karl died in Madeira 100 years ago. And be sure that there will be more conferences like this one. In this spirit, I'd like to end this little encounter with this approved prayer from the Gebetsliga. O Lord Jesus Christ, the redemption you won for us gives the world order and peace, which we too often refuse. Mercifully receive our work and prayer as an atonement for all injustices done against your most sacred heart and against all religious and earthly authority through rebellion and war. May our prayers and sacrifices help 
bring peace to the world and atone the multiple injustices, indignities and slander done against your servant, Karl of Austria, and bring him soon to the honor of public veneration as a saint. Amen. Thank you very much.